this what you want? This fucking foliage? Is this what you want? Mr. Dips? Is this what you want? Me standing in front of EC3 buying designer coats? Is this what you want? Me sitting in some hipster hotel in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, fluffing pillows? Is this what you want? I don't believe this. This graffiti art, the hotels, avocado toast. All I want is a fucking Guinness, an ice cold Guinness. What the hell does that mean? Oh, this is what you wanted. This is your Monday Night Raw review right here on Off The Script. Man, I knew watching SummerSlam last night was bad for my health. I knew it. I watched SummerSlam last night, and then this morning, I woke up really, really, really ill. I feel like shit. Sore throat right now. Even now, as I'm recording, I have a sore throat. I have mucus dripping from my fucking eyes and my nose down into my throat. I don't know what the hell I got. I was coughing. I woke up more exhausted. I woke up more exhausted. After a full night's sleep. I don't know what the fuck's going on, but I feel like shit. But Monday Night Raw happened, and Sasha Banks turned heel, so I have to be here to talk about it. My girl Sasha Banks is back. The boss is back. And more so than any other time that we've seen Sasha Banks on the main roster in the bullshit that Vince McMahon has given her. For the first time in over four years, we've seen the NXT version of Sasha Banks back on Monday Night Raw. I, I cannot say anything bad about that whatsoever. I love it. I absolutely love it. We're going to go over. I do have my concerns about it. Of course I do. Can't leave it alone, JD. You got to complain about it, but I have my concerns about it. We're going to go over the positives and the negatives of Sasha Banks coming back on the Raw after SummerSlam, turning heel on not only Natalia, but on Becky Lynch and what this means for Sasha Banks' character moving forward. So we'll talk about that tonight. Drew McIntyre and Cedric Alexander had probably, if you wanted to put this up against anything on SummerSlam's card, this could have easily been the best match of the night. And I loved every minute of what they did on Monday Night Raw tonight. And we're going to go over that great match and why that match should be the standard in what we see WWE announced a new King of the Ring tournament is coming starting next week. And it's not a field of eight. It's a field of 16. It's, it's really funny how the G1 just finished up. And we got Kota Ibushi winning the, the G1 Climax. And now all of a sudden, WWE wants to get into the tournaments on Monday Night Raw. Does anybody find that to be a weird coincidence or is it just me? I don't know, but I've been asking for it for the last... Five years, and we're going to go over it, and yes, I do have my worries, and I do have my complaints, but I can't complain too much, because man, the king of the ring is coming back to WWE, and this could be the beginning of a brand new start for somebody. This could be the moment somebody is catapulted into the spotlight on WWE television. That is better uh, left unsaid, because with this company, I say it, and it doesn't happen, and normally when they're supposed to do something, they don't do it, and they do the opposite. Again, I have no hope, but I am excited, and I can't wait to see what they do next week with my favorite concept, or one of my favorite concepts, in the WWE, the King of the Ring. This was not a good show tonight, folks. A heel turn for Sasha Banks, and an announcement of the King of the Ring tournament coming back, mixed with a Drew McIntyre and Cedric Alexander match that could have rivaled anything on SummerSlam's card Sunday night. Does not make a good show. You look at the overall picture of this three-hour show, and it was not a good show. I know there'll be some stupid fucking idiot in the community. Oh my god, this was the best Raw of all time! This was the best Raw of 2019! I can't do my goon voice because of my throat, so I gotta do a, a mixture of the goon slash old lady. I know there'll be some idiot in the community, and all I have to say is... Whatever floats your boat, man. 
You like that cup of coffee? I don't. I like my coffee light and sweet. Some of you might like it black. That's exactly what this show was. It wasn't a good show. It wasn't a good show. There was too much filler on this show. And again, I'm going to go over exactly what I would change and how to change that throughout this one-hour podcast tonight. Got a lot to talk about, man, but thank you guys so very much for joining me right here on Monday Night Raw. This is off the script. If you missed anything, please, I urge you to go down into the comment section. We got everything from the weekend that you might have missed. SummerSlam predictions. If you missed it, SummerSlam's over, I know, but who cares? Go back and watch it. It's a great two hours of entertainment. SummerSlam predictions. We got NXT TakeOver Toronto official review of the show. Go and check that out. Off the script. Make sure you guys go and check that out. And, of course, the main event of the entire weekend. So, well, TakeOver was my main event. But in view-wise, view-wise, analytic-wise, SummerSlam was definitely the main event of the weekend. Thank you guys so much for showing up in Legions for that. We're nearing 50,000 views and 2,000 likes as always. Thank you guys so very much. If you missed my SummerSlam review and everything else, everything you need is linked down below in the comments. Go and check it out. I'm going to pin that. At the very top, very easy access for you guys. So make sure you go check that out and show some support. Make sure you guys follow me on social media at JD from NY206. That is on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you to all the new followers. Thank you guys for tweeting along with me all weekend, including tonight, as we watch our girl Sasha Banks come back and turn heel and give us the boss, the real boss. I'm Becky Lynch and Natalia at JD from NY206. That's both on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If you guys want to support the podcast on Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. What's up to my patrons over there? You guys are getting the audio version of this right after the live version goes on YouTube. So thank you guys so very much for all that. And the sponsor tonight, my good, good, good friends over at The Ridge. Ridge.com slash scripts. I got the Sunburst Titanium Ridge wallet, and I absolutely love it. It was one of the best purchases that I've made this year, I promise you guys. I don't put my name to something that I do not use and I do not believe in. Lifetime guarantee. Ridge built this wallet so sturdy that it's going to include a lifetime guarantee. It also includes... RFID blocking. You guys can breathe easy. Your cards will be surrounded by the metal body of this wallet, protecting them from the most powerful RFID chip readers. It's functional and slim. It holds 1 to 12 cards without stretching out. The slim wallet is ideal for carrying business cards, which I do all the time, everywhere I go. Your credit cards, your debit cards, bills, and you guys can actually put on the back of the wallet a strap or a money clip the metal money clip allows you to clip several bills inside your wallet, available with a cash wrap like I mentioned as well, and you guys can have either one of them on your wallet, completely up to you, and it's ultimate in durability, aluminum plating and interchangeable elastic screws, you guys are going to have a wallet that is going to last you a lifetime. Again guys, ridge.com slash script, code script at checkout for 10% off, and I want to thank them for supporting the podcast right here on Off The Script. The WWE made the announcement tonight that next week we will be seeing a 16-man, or at least the start of, a 16-man tournament known as the King of the Ring. One of the most prestigious events in the history of WWE. The 1993 King of the Ring is probably... I'm going to go out on a limb here. Some of you might be too young to realize the epicness of this show. I will always remember Hulk Hogan flopping around like a fish when he took the leg drop and the belly-to-belly -belly suplex from Yoko Zuna with Bobby the Brain Heenan yelling, Hulkamania is dead. The bright lights of the WWF were once again too much for the Hulkster. I never, ever, 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 ever Forgot Bobby Heenan, Jim Ross, and Macho Man Randy Savage on commentary that night. Easily one of the most entertaining aspects on any pay-per-view that I've ever watched, ever. The, 90, the 1993 King of the Ring is the greatest pay-per-view that the company's ever done. And if they, 
and this is a stretch. It's not 1993. WWE does not really give a shit about their history. It needs to be epic. It really does. I've been asking for the King of the Ring for as long as this podcast has been alive. Since episode one, I believe one of the very first videos that I did. You guys can go into the annals of the of the podcast. Not It wasn't even a podcast at that point. I didn't know what I was doing on YouTube. I was mixing Call of Duty commentary and Call of Duty gameplay with wrestling talk because I loved both. I was big into the Call of Duty community when things were normal on YouTube. And I was trying to get my feet wet into talking about wrestling because I love pro wrestling. And I did a why WWE should bring back the King of the Ring. Now, I don't even want to listen to what I had to say there, you guys. I'm sure some of you are going to go back and watch the cringe that old JD was. But I am glad that they're bringing this back. I do find it rather weird that the G1 Climax just finished up and Kota Ibushi is the G1 Climax winner for 2019. And now WWE wants to get into the tournament field on Monday Night Raw. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. I do have my concerns about this. Is WWE going to make it feel important? Everything that happens on Monday Night Raw usually has the soul ripped out from it. Is WWE going to put the effort into this thing and make it special? We're going to talk about how great Cedric Alexander and Drew McIntyre was tonight on Monday Night Raw. I am telling you right now, and I know for a fact there are people listening to me that want to listen to me, take what I say seriously, and then go and block me on social media. I'm talking to some people in the WWE, some of you main eventers out there who are nothing more than pussies. I am telling you right now, I want to see the King of the Ring. In fact, I don't want to see, we need to see. The King of the Ring be exactly what Cedric Alexander and Drew McIntyre did tonight. If we don't get, if we don't get that type of match in this tournament every single time those guys go out there in the ring, then it's a complete waste of time. Seriously. That needs to be the foundation of what makes this tournament. Now, WWE has eight men from SmackDown and eight men from Monday Night Raw. I don't know what that means. I don't know if they're going to be separated in brackets. I don't know if WWE is going to do a half of a tournament for Raw, half of a tournament on SmackDown, or they're going to do a field of 16 and mix mix and match everybody where it's going to be Raw and SmackDown throughout the entire tournament. I think they should do eight on Raw and eight on SmackDown with the winner being Raw versus SmackDown. Whenever that finals is, whether it's at a pay-per-view I don't know. WWE has not given us any indication as to what the winner gets in the King of the Ring. I can only hope it's a number one contendership for whatever title they're going for. If a SmackDown guy wins it, number one contender for Kofi Kingston and the WWE Championship. Monday Night Raw wins it, number one contender for Seth Rollins and the Universal Championship. These are some of the things that I would like to see. These are some of the things that we need to see as far as this tournament goes. Do I want to see Sami Zayn in the tournament and go out losing in two minutes? No. No. This needs to be a fresh start. Sami Zayn was already announced for the tournament. Sami Zayn's a loser. I don't think Sami Zayn's a loser. I love Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn, I always think back to his match with Shinsuke Nakamura. You look back at that match at NXT TakeOver Dallas, that's what the final should look like. Sami Zayn is too good to throw into a tournament for King of the Ring with implications of a possible championship and him go out in two minutes. You're not booking this tournament to be squash matches. You're booking this tournament to legitimately give guys like Sami Zayn a shot at redeeming themselves. I hope you do know he has not won one singles match since coming back on the Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania. Now, I don't know if you find that to be fucked up, but I certainly do. This tournament needs to be epic. I hope WWE knows what they're doing with this. I have no hope on Monday Night Raw. I have no hope with anything on Monday Night Raw. Like I said, Monday Night Raw sucks the soul from everything. Everything. Once good, not anymore. Ricochet is the latest example of that. Now, 
Again, I find it weird that WWE is going into the tournament aspect. I know for a fact I've had people tell me who are in the know that Vince hates tournaments. I don't know if this is a Paul Heyman directive, but I like it. I have hope that he, if he's in charge of this, knows what he's doing. I would have much rather seen this as a pay-per-view. I heard on social media today around 5, 6 o'clock, wrestle votes. Whoever's in charge of that, I am jealous. Sean Ross Sapp actually met the seven people who run the wrestle votes account. I would love to see these individuals. I would love to meet them. I think that would be pretty sweet. But they tweeted out that WWE could potentially be looking for a new king. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Clearly, we got the answer tonight. And I said in the comments of that thread on Twitter, Great! King of the Ring possibly coming back? Maybe it's an inkling of an idea. WWE comes out on Monday Night Raw and announces a whole fucking tournament to begin next week. I wouldn't have done it that way. I really wouldn't have done it that way. I really wish, and what I really want to have happen, and what WWE really should do is just completely blow up the entire pay-per-view calendar because nothing means... Nothing means anything anymore. There's no importance in anything. Summers, look at SummerSlam last night. Look at how unimportant everything felt. Rollins got away by the skin of his fucking ass after everything WWE did wrong with his last title reign. Now he is a second time Universal Champion. He redeemed himself after a great match. It didn't make sense how he just battled back and didn't sell any of the rib injuries, which I failed to mention on my podcast last night which is a little bit ridiculous, and it takes away from the believability of the overall match, but I'm not going to nitpick. It was probably the best Universal Championship match that that title has ever seen. But I honestly feel like these pay-per-views should mean something. SummerSlam means nothing. The Royal Rumble means nothing anymore. The winner of the Royal Rumble doesn't even main event WrestleMania anymore. It's who WWE chooses. More times than not, it's Roman Reigns. This week, we... Oh, not, not this week. This year... We got Becky Lynch winning the Royal Rumble, and at least she main evented WrestleMania. So at least we got some sense of that coming true this year, but more times than not, the winner of the Royal Rumble does not main event WrestleMania. You could look back to the year prior, Nakamura won the Royal Rumble, and he never main evented WrestleMania with AJ Styles, even though that match should have. But we all know Vince and his hard-on for Mr. Reigns. What I'm saying is, I do believe that WWE needs to make these pay-per-views feel special. King of the Ring should be slotted in June. Royal Rumble in January, WrestleMania in April, King of the Ring in June. Do you realize, and I've said this multiple times and I'm going to repeat myself again, you do realize that when the June pay-per-view is something like King of the Ring, it gives every show meaning. Meaning that you have, and I hope that this is the case leading up to the finals of this year's King of the Ring, Every Monday Night Raw now has specific meaning. Every show is going to be important because you're going to see who's advancing into the next round and into the next round. Monday Night Raw is going to have meaning meaning leading up to the finals. The pay-per-view, if it was slotted in June, it would give the finals a meaning because you'd already have your SummerSlam main event booked. You would have your SummerSlam main event booked and you would give a legitimate meaning to the challenger having the number one contendership challenging the champion. This is what I want. This is what is needed. These pay-per-views don't mean shit. WWE's coming up with challenges for these titles out of uh, a fucking uh, coin toss. On the basis of a coin toss or choosing a name out of a hat or, worst case scenario, having Kofi Kingston go out there and I challenge Randy Orton. Nobody wants to see that. It's not the way you go about doing things. King of the Ring should have meaning. That's what I wish they did. I wish they would have waited till next year. But we're getting it now. That's just me nitpicking. That's me fantasizing about what would be a perfect world in WWE. And we all know that with Vince alive, there will never be a perfect WWE. But it's coming back. But all I could say is this. I'm excited about 16. That's a different take on it. Cedric and Drew. Use that as the foundation of what every single fucking match in this tournament should be. That's all I will say on that. So you want my thoughts on the King of the Ring? There you go. Monday Night Raw opened up with Seth Rollins. Man, I heard those uh, reactions on Sunday night kind of dwindling already on Monday night. 
Everybody loved to chant, burn it down, but when Rollins was in the ring, I didn't really get that grandiose championship reaction there, champ. It's already declining. And the more WWE continues to pull stunts like they did tonight, Rollins' reign is going to be worse than the first one. Seth made his entrance to the ring. Monday Night Rollins is back. Yeah, if you give me the 2018 version of Seth Rollins, where he actually came off like a fucking beast, then maybe. This is the 2019 version of Seth Rollins. A fucking pussy. Says Seth was in a fight last night, Corey Graves said. Cole said it was one of the grittiest performances he has ever witnessed. That's fine. That's fine. You could say whatever you want about it. It was a great match. Seth came into the ring. He was emotional with all the cheers. Renee says she's not sure. Seth believes he's once again Universal Champion. I was saying I don't believe Seth Rollins miraculously changed everything from just a couple of weeks ago to everything being in his favor. That's what I was surprised about. Seth said he has to be honest with the fans because he doesn't know any other way. SummerSlam, he didn't know if he had a chance to beat Brock Lesnar. He said he walked into the ring injured and lacking confidence. Yeah, you were really injured because you pulled off a great frog splash off the fucking steel post through a table. Yeah, you were so injured. Anyway, he was injured and lacking confidence and he stared the beast in the eyes and he defeated him. Now, I did, I did have a worry because Heyman was there in the back of Monday Night Raw. There was a moment in the night where Charlie Caruso tried to interview Paul Heyman and he went into Brock Lesnar's locker room. Now, I don't know if Brock Lesnar was there. It was probably done just for aesthetics or your imagination. I don't think Brock Lesnar was there. He went back home to Saskatchewan. But I did have a slight worry that they did put together this King of the Ring for Brock Lesnar to eventually get back to Seth Rollins because they made a big deal on social media before Monday Night Raw went off the air or before Monday Night Raw hit the air that Paul Heyman was complaining that WWE's rematch clause is no longer in effect. Now it's no longer in effect. Really. But just on Sunday night, the Iconics got a rematch against the team of Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross for the women's tag team titles. So now on Monday, the edict of no rematches is in effect. Do you see how off WWE is? So I was worried that WWE was actually going to use this King of the Ring tournament to get Brock Lesnar in the tournament to get back to Seth. I hope that's not the case. I hope that's not the case whatsoever. JD, who do you think is going to win the King of the Ring? Or who would you think should be King of the Ring? I'm going with Andrade. If you guys want my answer on that, which I didn't cover in the open when I talked about the King of the Ring. King Andrade got a nice ring to it. I could see Andrade wearing the robe. I could see Andrade wearing the crown. And man, I could see Zelina Vega sitting at the right hand of the King. I like that. I like that. Let's make it happen, WWE. Let's make it happen. So... Fans begin chanting Beast Slayer. Said he emptied his tank, but then something happened. You guys came alive. And in that moment, you took me to a place I've never been in my entire career, except for WrestleMania. You took me to a place I couldn't go on my own, except for WrestleMania. You took me to a place where we could go together. You won the Royal Rumble, and you went to WrestleMania because of us. We wanted you there. We were there for you. At WrestleMania. I guess WrestleMania is a fucking mirage in the eyes of Seth Rollins. Seriously. Show some fucking credibility to what happened earlier in the year. This is not the greatest moment of your life. Winning the title at WrestleMania against Brock Lesnar should be the biggest moment of your career. In fact, the cash in on Seth Rollins at 31 was probably the biggest moment of your career. Everything else that's happening now pales in comparison to what you did there. That's just my opinion. He took me to a place I couldn't go on my own. He took me to, or they took me, the fans rather, where we could go together. He said in that moment he knew he had to slay the beast. He said it was then he remembered he was Seth freaking Rollins. And that's why he is standing here as the universal champion. And then out comes AJ Styles. I didn't have any excitement for AJ's music hitting whatsoever. He walked out with the OC. They entered the ring. The OC wanted to be the first to congratulate the champ. 
And Styles says that he might not have to worry about Brock anymore, but he has to worry about the man standing in front of him right now. Styles says since he's come to his senses, he has a lot to prove. He says he wants to prove he is a much better champion than he is. Seth said he's always had a ton of respect for Seth Ra- uh, for uh, AJ Styles. Styles says he should listen to the fans because at this moment the fans were chanting yes after AJ says he wants to show Seth who the better champion is on Monday Night Raw. Seth says he doesn't back down from a fight, so he challenged AJ Styles to a match later tonight, so it was accepted. Graves then says he wondered if this was a wise move for Seth Rollins, given how much he was beaten up at SummerSlam. Like, it didn't bother him then. Why should it bother him now? So he offered a handshake to Seth Rollins, did AJ, and he left Gallows and Anderson, by themselves, they escorted themselves out of the ring. He was in the middle of the ring, and they actually shook hands. And AJ, teasing a bad guy move, walked away and then wanted to quick shot Seth Rollins in the jaw. The OC got on the ring apron, and AJ Styles was laughing at Seth Rollins. Ha, 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 look at him. He's worried. Three on one. So that was pretty much it. I didn't mind. This was a lot better than last week. Whatever Rollins was crying about last week, that's really just nauseated me to no end. This was a lot better than it was last week, but I said it on SummerSlam's podcast. Whatever they do with him from here on out is going to be more important than anything that they've ever done before. Everybody got excited, including me, about the match because I love good wrestling, and it was a good match. It was a match that invested me and a match that got me, you know, emotionally in there in the moment. But that wasn't the end. That was only the beginning, folks. Rollins winning the title was only the beginning. The most important aspect of all of this was not what happened at SummerSlam. The most important aspect of all this was, what are they going to do next? Who is Seth Seth Rollins' opponent going to be going into Clash of Champions? How are they going to book him going into Clash of Champions? Who do they have lined up to take on the Universal Champion? If it's AJ Styles, I'm not excited about it. We've seen this already. And this is taking AJ from the mid-card, leaving the United States Championship, you know, without anyone to fight AJ over it. That's not what we really need on Monday Night Raw. Spread the wealth. If it's AJ, I am not really for this title fa- uh, this title feud or this match at the pay-per-view. I don't think it is, but that was their, their way to get this match in everybody's minds. Maybe they want to revisit that again. I don't, I don't, I don't want to see it again. I don't want to sit here and watch another Seth Rollins and AJ Styles match because there's more harm with that than good. I think this is a WrestleMania match that they should really save if they want to cross that bridge again. Keep these guys away from one another. We don't need another AJ Seth Rollins feud. You did it in May. We don't need to see it again in September. Now, whatever they got with Seth, you could look at the main events on this show and look at what happened to close the show And it offers absolutely no excitement. And we'll talk about that when we get to the ending. But whatever they got planned right now, I don't have any hope for Seth Rollins. I think this feud, whatever they got planned, is going to be a lot worse than what we've seen going into the summer with Baron Corbin. Because at least Baron Corbin was somewhat enjoyable to watch on the microphone. And he's a lot better in the ring than who I think they're going to put in the ring with Seth Rollins. It's all but confirmed that Braun Strowman is probably going to be next in line with the Universal Championship. I cannot get behind that whatsoever. That boat has sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and I hope it's never recovered. I really do. I have zero interest in Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman, to me, is dead in the water. And that's not even his fault. The guy can't fucking wrestle for shit, but that's not his fault. WWE, start, stop, start, stop. Braun Strowman doesn't have backstage etiquette? Punished. Braun Strowman's got to wrestle these fucking SNL guys at WrestleMania? Punished. You haven't given him anything of a priority. He's a one-trick pony. The guy can't wrestle a regular wrestling match without some sort of overexposed gimmick. I'm not for it. Seth Rollins' title reign? You should be booking this guy against the Ricochets of the world and, and the Andrades of the world and the Rey Mysterios of the world. You know? It's ridiculous. This is your fault. 
You haven't built up anybody underneath Rollins to challenge him on that brand. You haven't. Now you expect him to go into a match with Styles, which is not going to do anything. You expect him to go into a feud with Braun Strowman. It's not going to do anything. Now these are just what ifs. We don't know what the hell they're going to do. But there really is no one else on this show for Rollins to even go into the pay-per-view against. It's either AJ or it's Braun Strowman. Who is it going to be? They don't have anybody on this show. Monday Night Raw is so weak when it comes to the top of the card that Rollins, if you look at it, has zero competition. You talk about SmackDown Live, I could pick two or three different guys over there. I'd love for Rollins to go into the ring against. It's Monday Night Raw. They haven't done a good job at all at giving him credible opponents. And they're going to make the same mistake again if they don't get their fucking act together. We're going to be right back to square one with this guy, and everyone is going to hate him. I don't want to hate him. I want to enjoy what he does. He's too good at what he does. Get on the fucking right track with this guy and give him a credible title reign. It goes back to WWE not being able to book baby faces. They have no problem booking heels. And for all the people thinking, JD, what about The Fiend? Do you want his title reign to be one month? There are, there are some out there that, that, that probably want that to happen. But you can't put The Fiend in that situation because what has The Fiend done? What has Bray Wyatt done to guarantee himself a Universal Championship? Nothing. Only time will tell what they do with Seth Rollins. But right now, what they did with him here tonight, I'm not for it at all. Just as unexciting as what happened before his match with Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. Shree Profits were hanging out. Montez Ford began singing about Seth Rollins. Angelo Dawkins was half asleep the entire show. He said the after party last night after SummerSlam went a little bit too long and he was a little dehydrated. Sami Zayn walked up to them, says he gets how exciting it might seem to them, but the longer they're there, the parasites in the crowd will suck the soul out of both of you. Am I writing Sami Zayn's promos? I'll let you know on Friday. Anyway, I love Sami Zayn. I wish that they would do more with him. He says it happens to everybody. He said Seth Rollins is the perfect example. He said Seth once saw Raw and he became uh, a fucking product of the machine. He said Seth, Seth was Raw and gritty and now he's become a pandering fool. He says it's pathetic. He said the same thing about Becky Lynch. When Becky Lynch became the man, it was real, but now it feels manufactured. Dawkins noticed that Samoa Joe walked up behind Sammy. He asked if Sammy, uh, we asked Sammy if Samoa Joe is another example of what he's talking about. And he went on and on and on to complain about Samoa Joe. Sammy said, Samoa Joe arrived like King Kong and last week he was worried about Roman Reigns. And Samoa Joe let Sammy know if he, you know, wants to get something off his chest, we could do it here tonight. Joe says, since he's such a big softy, he wanted to give Sammy a chance to get everything off his chest in the ring tonight, right now. He said maybe he could show everyone he is more than Kevin Owens' water boy. And he shoved Sammy very hard into some production crates. Going back to the Street Profits, man, why are they beating the Undisputed Era at TakeOver Toronto? Why are they serious on NXT, but on Monday Night Raw, they're alcoholics, and they're drinking with Ric Flair and smoking doobies with RVD at the reunion show. I don't know. What is this stereotyping here with the Street Profits? They're the NXT Tag Team Champions for a reason. But on Monday Night Raw, they're depicted as alcoholics and stoners. I don't know. Not really liking it, man. Not really liking it. I think they got charisma for days. And I think you guys are going to enjoy them once you see them in the ring. But I don't like what WWE is doing to the Street Profits on Monday Night Raw. Very, very stereotypical garbage. So we got Sami Zayn versus Samoa Joe. This match went one minute. Sami Zayn lost via submission. I pray to God that this is not Sami Zayn's first round match in the King of the Ring tournament. Meaning one minute, one minute pins, one minute losses via submission. Come on. Seriously, what did Sami Zayn do to piss off someone in the back? Seriously, who the fuck did he piss off? Awful. Absolutely awful. Fans chanted Joe. I'm thinking that this is a babyface turn. We all thought that Joe coming to the aid of Roman Reigns was a babyface turn. 
Then Joe got on the microphone. Fans chanted Joe. Joe said afterwards on the microphone that while he may forgive Reigns for pointing the finger of blame at him for the so-called freak accidents that have been happening backstage, that forgiveness isn't extended to anyone in the audience. Crowd boot. He said they thought he was capable of such heinous atrocities, and because of that, he will never forgive any of you people. And that's what Samoa Joe ended with and walked out of the ring. A lot of people are saying, oh, Joe turned babyface and then turned heel in the same night. I think this is still babyface Joe. Do you expect Joe to fucking walk up to Monday Night Raw with a bouquet of flowers in his hand? Do you expect Samoa Joe to be walking up to Monday Night Raw and go into the ring with a fucking smile on his face like Apollo Crews? This is Samoa Joe. He is a submission specialist. He is the Samoan submission machine. He's the destroyer, Samoa Joe. He's going to go in there and be Samoa Joe. He's going to get on the microphone and be Samoa Joe. I don't give a shit what Joe tells me. Joe can look me in the fucking face and tell me I'm a complete fucking asshole. I'm going to still enjoy Samoa Joe just as much. Because that's what Joe does. I don't want Joe to be some sniveling fucking pussy like we seen last week. This is Samoa Joe. He's got to be a fucking beast. He has to be a man. And that's exactly what we got here. So, you're going to cheer Samoa Joe because he comes off as legit. And he's got every ounce of legitimacy when he gets on the microphone. And clearly, when he beats scrubs like Sami Zayn in one minute. Dolph Ziggler... And The Miz, my buddy Kevin Castle of the Don Tony and Kevin Castle show, tweeted out that The Miz and Dolph Ziggler are both get off my TV worthy. He's like, when The Miz is on TV, he is channel changing garbage. You pair that with Dolph Ziggler and boom, you're killing two birds with one stone. I have to agree with him. I have to agree with him. Babyface Miz is so terrible. It, it really is. It's not enjoyable. It's not entertaining. It's it's so unnatural. It is so unnatural. And then you got Dolph Ziggler, who loses tonight in a match with The Miz. Ziggler was in the ring with a microphone in his hand. And he says, I hope you're happy, Miz. Said Miz knew he didn't have a chance against him at SummerSlam, so he stuck Goldberg on him at SummerSlam. Now, he said he got smeared so many times yesterday that he can't medically be cleared tonight. He said Miz's plan backfired and Miz screwed Miz. A take on the Brett screwed Brett because they're in Canada. Touche, WWE. You can't let it go. So, he called the fans bloodthirsty Canadians. Ziggler pretended to leave the ring. Miz turned his back on Dolph Ziggler. Ziggler then attacked Miz from behind and ripped off his Toronto is awesome t-shirt. And then we got a match. And then the Miz ends up winning in about five minutes and makes Dolph Ziggler tap out to a figure four leg lock. Can we get Dolph Ziggler off of our TVs, please? This guy, I don't know who enjoys watching a loser. I, I don't know what they're doing with him. I really don't. So Miz made Dolph Ziggler tap out to the figure four. He gets on the microphone and he says that the Miz is not even the best wrestler in his family. That Maurice is a better wrestler. I knew you were a coward. You don't have the balls to come down here and finish me off like a man. So the Miz came down to the ring. Dolph Ziggler was blithering. Uh, he was a blithering idiot on the microphone. Yap, 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 yap. He had his back turned. Skull crushing finale. And Dolph Ziggler hits the mat face first. Dolph Ziggler, I know he's not, but man, did he make the most foolish decision that one could make in pro wrestling. I don't know why this guy didn't go and give Cody Rhodes a call. Bro, do you need anybody after John Moxley to go against Kenny Omega? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Dolph Ziggler and Kenny Omega or Dolph Ziggler and... Cody Rhodes or Dolph Ziggler and fucking Pentagon or Phoenix or anybody, man. Anybody. This guy is a fucking idiot. He really is. This guy is a loser. I don't know who enjoys portraying a loser like he does. Oh, he's getting paid. 
Oh, he's on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, Monday Night Raw show with declining ratings as they go into their new deal with Fox Sports. Yeah, great. Dolph Ziggler ain't turning heads. Dolph Ziggler isn't keeping people glued to the television. The guy's a loser. Why is he even there? Get him off of my TV. He is right back to being in the same spot he was before he went away. And it's absolutely terrible. And The Miz is no better. The Miz being a babyface, especially losing to Shane McMahon, that was the fucking cherry on top of that shit Sunday. Garbage. Get them away from me. Period. Get The Miz being back to a heel and get Dolph Ziggler off TV completely. The guy is a complete fucking loser. Elias sat in the ring. Corey Graves begged people to don't change the channel. Don't change the channel. Not yet. Not too late, Corey. I already, I already changed the channel. I went to go watch Guy's Grocery Games. Robert Irvine was on. Can't say no to Robert Irvine. I would never say no to Robert Irvine. He fucking kicked my ass and anybody's ass, really. Anyway. Elias said, last night another legend interrupted him. He says he's getting the hang of how this all works now. Oh, really? Now you're just getting the hang of how all this works. It's been happening for three fucking years. Now you're just getting the hang of it? Man, Elias is the smartest guy in all pro wrestling. He does basically nothing and reaps the benefits of it. He's getting paid great. He does nothing. I didn't say he was the best. But man, he's the smartest guy in the business. He literally does nothing. Absolutely nothing. He asked whoever is going to interrupt him, just come on out. So he gave a 3-2-1, nothing. A 3-2-1, nothing. Graves then said again, don't change the channel. And then out comes Ricochet. We hear that cheesy gunshot Ricochet sound. And Ricochet comes out. He said, Elias, the people interrupt you and everybody interrupts you because you suck. That's a clever insult, Elias says. Said a guy who comes out there dressed as a comic book character won't tell him what's cool and what's not. I will embarrass you in this ring tonight. Get a referee out here. Referee ran down. Ricochet and Elias was about to happen, and I didn't give a shit whatsoever. Someone please tell me why this match was happening. Who asked for this match? Why was this match necessary? What were they fighting over? Seriously. This match meant absolutely nothing. How the mighty have fallen. Ricochet has given us a handful of near five-star classics in NXT. Adam Cole with Aleister Black as his tag team partner. Against DIY, against the War Raiders. That latter match for the North American Championship is matched with Gargano. Right? Matches with Velveteen Dream. Fucking four and five star classics up and down for the six to eight months he was there in NXT, right? Now he's on Monday Night Raw and he's in the ring with Elias and it means absolutely nothing. I don't know how this benefits Ricochet. This makes Ricochet look worse. Ricochet doesn't feel the same anymore. I said this time and time again. They don't know what to do with him. But at least he didn't come out dressed like fucking Nightwing on Monday Night Raw. He got rid of the vest that he was wearing on SummerSlam Sunday night. Thank God, he looked ridiculous. This one went four minutes. All I remember here is that they botched a head scissor takedown. Elias botched one of Ricochet's signature moves. Completely terrible. Matthew from Botchamania is going to have a fucking field day with that one. Again, I ask, who asked for this? Why is Elias in the ring with somebody who could legitimately wrestle? What happened here? Ricochet wins, and that was it. Rolled him up. Elias' left shoulder was off the mat. So there you go. Another reason to get this match next week in the King of the Ring tournament, which I hope to God is not the case. Fucking stupid, man. This is what you're doing with Ricochet on Monday Night Raw. You job him out to fucking AJ Styles. You make him look like a fucking loser, right? He gets the United States Championship for Samoa Joe, and he should have had a lengthy title reign, that guy could make that title feel important. And what'd you do? Oh, well, we, we got to get the OC back together. And we got them. We got we got them. And we got them on the new five-year deals. They got to be important. So let's give them all the titles and fuck the new guy. Give me a break. This match was garbage. Rey Mysterio and Andrade. Another match that 
we've been suckered into caring about time and time and time again. How long before someone says, enough is enough here? Again, what are they fighting over? What are they fighting over? This, this should be used in a way to get them into U.S. title contention. And nothing has happened. What are they fighting over? Andrade beat Rey Mysterio in a two out of three falls match. Two to zero. Is Andrade going to pick up the bill when they go out to dinner tomorrow night? What the fuck was on the line? Why do we need to see it again? We've seen this all through 2019. And you know what? Nothing has come from it. Nothing has resulted from these guys being in the ring. You would think Andrade gets a fucking U.S. title shot. Something. An IC title shot. Being that the IC title is on the brand that he's associated with. But no. He's here and Rey Mysterio looks like a loser once again. Why Rey Mysterio is even here, I don't know. Andrade, a two out of three falls match, by the way, which we've seen enough of. And they continue to do on Monday Night Raw time and time and time again. I think we're two out of three falls out after what happened with Gargano and Adam Cole. First fall ended in one minute. I understand you have a three-hour show, but I don't know on what planet. I seriously don't know on what planet Rey Mysterio is losing in one minute to anybody. I don't understand it. Oh, but JD, he's putting over new talents. But that doesn't mean Rey Mysterio needs to be treated like a fucking jobber. Yeah, he should be putting over new talents. But he did give up the United States Championship without really getting... A fair rematch due to injury. Does that mean he gets jobbed out every fucking match after that? One minute. Andrade wins in one minute. Zelina held Rey Mysterio's foot on the rope. And Andrade got the cheap leverage pin. Andrade went another five minutes with Rey. Got the hammerlock DDT on the on, on Rey Mysterio for the win. And Rey Mysterio loses a two out of three falls match. Two to zero. When did you see a two out of three falls match, A, end in six minutes, and someone wins 2-0? I knew that this was going to be one of those things that meant nothing at the end of the night, but I was surprised that they didn't go to commercial and use this as a way to fulfill Vince McMahon's edict, because that's what I thought it was. I honestly thought this match was made two out of three falls so that they can go to commercial break in the middle of a match to fulfill Vince McMahon's edict while it was disguised in a match with two guys that we actually love and respect and want to see more of. That's what I thought. So this one went six minutes with Andrade clean sweeping Rey Mysterio. And that was it. That was it. So for everybody saying, well, he's got to put over new talent. You know why he's putting over new talent, right? You know why he's losing and jobbing out and being treated like a schmuck on WWE television. I mentioned this on Off the Script this past weekend. Rey Mysterio is in the WWE for 18 months. He came into the WWE last October. We're going into October now. That would make a full 12 months. Rey Mysterio is going to be there through 2020, at least half of 2020. He'll probably finish up sometime right before the summer of 2020. I guarantee you, with what we're seeing with Rey Mysterio, I guarantee you that Rey Mysterio has already notified Vince McMahon that he wants out of his contract. Rey Mysterio signed a two-year deal with WWE for 24 months. The out clause was given to him as, you know, a special case scenario. He can be out after 18 months if they are not booking him to his liking. And there's no way Rey Mysterio is liking what's going on with him right now. Guarantee you he already told Vince McMahon he's out after 18 months. And I guarantee you that he's going to AEW. They would scoop him up in a fucking heartbeat. Rey Mysterio is the type of competitor that if you watch him now, he looks defeated. He looks like he doesn't even want to be there. The guy had fucking tears in his eyes. Whether this plays into a storyline or not, I don't know. But that looked to me like it could be a work shoot type of thing. That he really feels like he don't even want to be there. And I know if he goes to AEW, they would treat him with open arms and fucking respect, man. They would welcome him with open arms and treat him with the utmost respect. 
WWE is treating him like a fucking piece of shit. And the only reason why Rey Mysterio is in the WWE is because they didn't want him on the indies. They didn't want him on the indies. Now AEW is around, and now they don't want Rey to go to AEW because that's the first place he'd end up. And you know for a fact, if this is the end of Rey in the WWE, he doesn't want this to be the lasting impression that you got for his career. He's going to go somewhere and give you a fucking classic or two with the Omegas and the Pentagons and the Phoenix and the Cody's of the worlds. You know, this is pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. And what does this get Andrade? If this doesn't get him into the King of the Ring and eventually winning it all, I don't know what the fuck they're doing with Andrade. Let's get Andrade to where we need to get him. This tournament is for guys like Andrade. Get with the program. Michael Cole interviewed Stone Cold Steve Austin. This was nauseating. This was nauseating. Now I see why they had Bret Hart at SummerSlam come up to Seth Rollins and say, I just want to wish you good luck on your match with Brock Lesnar. You're going to kill him, champ. And he walked away after shaking Seth Rollins' hand. Now the pieces to the puzzle are beginning to come into place. Now they got Stone Cold Steve Austin, who arguably is Bret Hart's greatest rival in WWE. On top of that, they had DX, they had the NWO, vouch for Seth Rollins. Here we got Bret Hart at SummerSlam and Stone Cold Steve Austin on Monday Night Raw giving their praise to Seth Rollins and the match with Brock Lesnar. This was cringe. Now, yes, I know. This was done mainly for Steve Austin's new show on the USA Network. I forgot what it was called, but whatever the case is, he's got a new show that's probably on right now after Monday Night Raw. Sit down with Stone Cold or whatever the fuck it is. Real something with Stone Cold? I don't know what it is. Nor do I care. These cheesy reality shows, they never go away. But man, when I had to listen to Stone Cold Steve Austin talk about Seth Rollins and how he said the match was badass... But this is who he believes Seth Rollins was his whole career. He says he's always wondered who Seth is when he says Seth freaking Rollins, and now he knows who he is. He said the man is committed to be the best in the world, and when you believe like that, you can be anything. Cole then asked Austin if he had a chance to speak with Seth at the Raw reunion and if he had any advice for him. He replied on that after all these years that he finally is who he says he is, and he congratulated him for a badass win. And then Michael Cole plugged his new reality show on the USA Network. Do we really need Stone Cold Steve Austin to tell me how great of a match it was? I have my own eyes. I have my own ears. I can make my own assessments here on SummerSlam. SummerSlam was mainly garbage, except for the last 45 minutes. Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar probably had one of the best parts of SummerSlam last night. I don't need Stone Cold Steve Austin to tell me how great of a match it was. This is where WWE fucks up. And if they're not careful, people are going to really sit down and think about this. Hmm, they're really doing the same thing that they did with Roman Reigns with Seth Rollins. You people cannot let it just be. I don't understand why you need to go out of your way to get Austin on Skype. On Monday Night Raw to tell me how great of a match that was. I know how great of a match it was. You can't let the moment just be. You can't let Rollins just be. I don't even know why Rollins needed to be on this show. I don't know why Rollins needs to be on the show every single week. You do realize that when you're world champion, that when your world champion shows up every single week, That it gets fucking tiresome. Adam Cole doesn't show up every week. If Adam Cole showed up every single week with the Undisputed Era, I wouldn't like Undisputed Era as much as I do now. If the Velveteen Dream showed up with the North American Championship every single week, I wouldn't like the Velveteen Dream as much as I do. Champa never showed up. Champa never showed up. He showed up how many times during a particular set of tapings? You may be seeing him once every three weeks, every two weeks, if that. We see Rollins every fucking week. Why did people want Brock Lesnar to keep the Universal Championship? Why does Brock Lesnar get a better reaction than Seth Rollins? It's because Brock Lesnar is not seen every single week. I'm not saying take six months off, but I'm saying go the NXT route. 
show up once every two weeks, once every three weeks. You don't need to be there. You don't need to be in every fucking segment on the show. You don't need to be in two or three different segments on a, on a Monday night every week. This is what is going to get people burned out with Seth Rollins. And then you add this fucking shit. I don't need Steve Austin to tell me how great the match was. You're forcing something upon the people. You're forcing an opinion on the people. Some people might not have liked that outcome. Some people are genuinely pissed that Rollins is still the Universal Champion. Or he's the Universal Champion again. Some people are pissed that Lesnar is still not the Universal Champion. Now you're having one of the most beloved guys in the fucking wrestling industry come out and praise Seth Rollins? This is something they need to be very careful with. The more they do these type of stunts, the more Seth Rollins is going to be looked at as, I don't give a shit. He's the Universal Champion and I can't wait for him to lose the fucking title. They have to be careful. Let it breathe. Let the moment feel genuine on its own. The more that this stuff happens, the WWE is quick to take the plunger and jam it down your throat. You're going to eventually regurgitate it. It happened with Reigns. It happened It happened with the Universal title all through its history. It's happened with every babyface champion. This is not the way to book a babyface champion. I don't understand how difficult it is to book this guy. They had it right in 2018 and they fucked it up. They fucked it up. I guarantee you, if Rollins last year was in the main event of SummerSlam against Lesnar, we wouldn't be sitting here blasting the 2019 version of Seth Rollins. I don't know who the fuck this is. But WWE clearly has some sort of agenda with Seth Rollins on Monday night. And with stunts like this, it's not going to last long. It's not going to last long. People will go right back to booing this guy time and time and time again. And with what happened last uh, on the last segment of the show with Braun Strowman, which we'll get to a little bit later, WWE is fast heading down that same direction. We'll talk about that a little later. Montez Ford was talking about Rey Mysterio. Charlie Caruso interviewed Rey. She was asking him if he's met his match in Andrade. He started to get all teary-eyed and mentioned something about having a family to support. And he walked away. He walked away. I don't know what's going on with Rey. Who cares? The guy is, right now, being booked like shit. Montez Ford, like I said, said, Keep your head up, Rey. You're a legend, 619 forever. And then Dawkins passed out on a chair next to him. He woke up, and Montez says, Bro, we're on live TV. Ford brought up Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss facing the Kabuki Warriors for the Tag Team Championships. Dawkins chugged a gallon of water because they are depicted as alcoholics on Monday Night Raw. Cedric Alexander and Drew McIntyre. This one went seven minutes, and man, this was probably better than anything on SummerSlam's card outside of Bray Wyatt and the main event. This was fucking fantastic. And I've been telling you about Cedric. Get this man on TV and keep him on TV. There is Cedric Alexander sitting in the back every single week, and WWE didn't know what they had in this guy. Now everybody's seen it. Now everybody's seen it. Drew McIntyre, you see how good he is. I knew how good he was. But he's been fucking stuck with Shane McMahon. He's been stuck being a lackey for fucking Baron Corbin. This was awesome. Absolutely awesome. They went back and forth. We've seen a Spanish fly. We've seen some big moves. None bigger than the Claymore kick by Drew McIntyre at the end for the clean win. So much so that this brought the Scotiabank Arena to its fucking feet when he hit it. Cedric Alexander gave you the best sell of a Claymore kick that you will ever see from here on out. And I said it once, and I'm going to say it again. This match went seven minutes. This is the type of match that we need to see in the King of the Ring tournament. And I hope there's time limits in the King of the Ring tournament. I forgot to say that earlier on. This needs to be the foundation of how the King of the Ring matches should be booked. This was awesome. And I hope that we get this match again. If WWE smart, we get this match again. In the King of the Ring. I loved it. This was awesome. Probably the best thing of the entire night. Match-wise. No way, Jose. Conga line. Robert Roode. Two minutes. Glorious DDT. Who cares? Now, I don't know what this means. I mentioned this on Twitter. What does this mean? Another 
start stop push for Bobby Roode? Is this now the fourth push for Bobby Roode? Is it going to last this time? Or is it merely WWE booking Robert Roode because he's Canadian and Monday Night Raw was in Toronto? It's probably the third one. I don't really stand by anything that happened here with this match. It was just there because Robert Roode is Canadian and they needed two minutes to fill on live TV. Nothing more, nothing less. The Revival versus the Lucha House Party with Lindsay Dorado, Grand Metallique against Dash and Dawson. This one didn't even go to a decision because R-Truth chased to the ring by the 24-7 VIP in Titus Catering. Revival gave Truth a heart attack, of course, because they're in Toronto. And they actually pinned R-Truth and became co-24-7 champions. So then Kalisto gave the Selena Del Sol to Dawson. Dash Yank Kalisto out of the ring. Carmella then draped R-Truth over Dawson again to retain the title. I believe he is like 12-time champion or something like that. This is sad. This is absolutely sad. So R-Truth again became the 24-7 champion. And then R-Truth was chased to the back. And Drake Maverick was out there with flyers and he was trying to act all entertaining and I didn't laugh whatsoever. I don't know why they continue to book this fucking garbage on this show. So they're in the back. R-Truth says he is the 72 time 747 7-11 European TV champion or something like that. So if he's considering all of those things for his championship, then he means it's a joke. So if it's a joke, why is it on TV? It's not even funny. I legitimately say it's the 7-Eleven title. I would rather trade the fucking title in for a blue icy and a pack of fucking bubble gum and uh, a kicks. Oh, well, a uh, kicks. I love. By the way, I bought. I don't know why I got kicks on the mind. I bought kicks when I went to Walmart earlier this afternoon. I love kicks, man. Kicks is my favorite. One of my favorite cereals. Twix, Twix or Kit Kat. What? I'll gladly trade the 24/7 title in for a fucking Kit Kat. You know, give me a break. Yeah, give me a fucking break with this garbage. So then Elias comes up from behind and hits R-Truth from behind with a guitar and he pins R-Truth to become the 24-7 champion. Who cares? Get this shit off my TV. Hour three. Natalia makes her way to the ring and this is where things get a little... Uh, that second hour was completely garbage outside of Drew McIntyre and Cedric Alexander. Natalia made her way to the ring. She had her left arm in a sling. They went into the ring, and the fans were chanting, you tapped out. Natty got no reaction whatsoever from her Canadian fans. Goes to show you how much people love Natalia Neidhart. She said Becky out-wrestled her and was the better woman. She said she has a dislocated elbow and is getting an MRI. She said this is the part where she's supposed to take everything back. She said about Becky, but she won't change a goddamn thing. She said she meant every word. She said about Becky. She said she doesn't know... Uh, when or where, but they will do it again. She said in the meantime, she wants to share something special with the fans. She said this morning she woke up and remembered her father because she had a dream about her father, Jim Neidhart. She said her dad congratulated her in her dream and how proud he was of her. Fans started to uh, get behind Natty here because everybody loves the anvil. She said it was one year ago to the day that her dad died and Sasha Banks comes out to interrupt this segment. Now, I was kind of surprised and not yet, and not really surprised at all, but my attention was glued to the TV. Sasha came to the ring and she was very sweet to Natalia. She was wearing her jacket. She was in full ring gear. She had her signature pink hair. And then she goes to embrace Natty and give her some sweet words of motivation about Jim the Anvil. She goes over to get a microphone. And as she's going over to get a microphone, she quickly turns around and starts to attack Natalia. They hugged, had some words. Sasha X for the mic. And this is where everything got started, man. I'm like, yes. Yes. She's a heel. Finally. Finally. But I'm not getting excited yet. I'm not getting excited about this yet because I have my reservations with anything concerning Sasha Banks. So she whipped Natalia into the ringside steps, back into the ring. She grabbed the chair. 
She actually took off the pink hair, which was a wig, and revealed her new blue hair. Blue is one of my favorite colors, so she looked great in blue. So, she whipped Natalia into the ring side steps. Back in the ring, she grabbed the chair, brought it into the ring, kicked Natalia in the head, stomped away at the injured arm. Becky's music played, and she made the save on Natty, who she fought the night before at SummerSlam. So this is where things got interesting. Becky made the save. Sasha and Becky literally go at it. It reminded me of a fucking Toronto Maple Leafs ho a hockey fight. And Becky got the better of Banks. Banks started to retreat away from Becky Lynch. Becky followed her, but Sasha knocked Becky down. And she took a chair and blasted Becky Lynch over the back. I don't know how many times. It had to be at least double digits. It had to be double digits. Then she shot Becky with the chair on the arm, which I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it might have been a fuck up. I don't know. It looked brutal. The chair shots were brutal. Sasha went in on Becky Lynch. Chair shots, referees came to stop all this madness, and that was pretty much it. Sasha was actually getting thank you Sasha chants when she blasted Natalia into the steel steps. So I'm like, well, I'm not really surprised by that because it's fucking Toronto the night after SummerSlam and Sasha Banks is a returning fan favorite. So they probably don't want to process everything that's happening right now. And N Natty just sucks. There's nothing important about Natty whatsoever. Nobody gives a shit about Natty. So I understand the thank you Natty chance. But then Becky Lynch came down. And Becky Lynch came to save Natty. And then Sasha... Continued the, the, the attack on Becky Lynch. I have my reservations about this. I hope WWE doesn't fuck this up. I really don't. Becky was going in on Sasha on social media. Saying that Sasha took her ball and went home with it. She never came back. She couldn't cut it. Just like Ronda. She was going in on Sasha. And it could be... It could be one of those things that could be looked at like... You know, they're working everybody. Or it could come off as legit. Because you can associate that with Sasha taking her ball and going home. And everybody thought that she wasn't coming back. Now, I don't want people to call me a hypocrite. I'm happy Sasha Banks is back. I, I did not expect Sasha Banks to fucking sit out three years of her contract and wait to go to AEW. That's just fucking living in a fantasy world. This woman is contractually obligated to be a WWE superstar. She might have needed all this time off to just fucking let herself go and just... Empty all this negativity out of her body because what WWE did to her was just throw negativity at her time and time and time again. She wanted to cleanse herself. And she did. If you follow her Instagram stories, she was living her life. She was on vacation every other week. She got a beautiful puppy. She was living life. She was happy. And all I want for her is happiness. Having her come back tonight, she was refreshed. She looked like she was happy to be there. And I understand why people are going to associate her with being a hypocrite, but what do you really expect? Do you really expect her to pull a CM Punk? Do you really think WWE is going to release Sasha Banks from her contract the longer she sits out? This is not a Neville situation, folks. AEW wasn't around when Neville walked out. WWE's not going to let Sasha Banks just willingly out of her contract because the first place she's going to go is to the phone and call Mr. Rhodes. WWE's not going to allow that. Sasha knew she only had one thing to do, and that was to come back. But I'm hoping that under her own terms that they came to some sort of agreement and things are going to be better. I hope. Now, I do have my concerns about immediately thrusting her into a program with Becky Lynch. I, I, I have problems with it. I do. Nothing in this company is special. This is a WrestleMania-worthy match that WWE is already teasing us for Clash of Champions. I cannot sit here and tell you I agree with that. I don't want to see these two go at it. Just like Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch doesn't need to be on TV every single week. Sasha could easily run through most of the Raw women's roster and then get to Becky Lynch and then tease a match with Becky Lynch. I understand why they did everything they did tonight. Because Sasha... Needed a new direction. If babyface Sasha came back, it would feel like nothing was different. It would feel like nothing was different. And they did what they did tonight. I can almost guarantee you 
I can almost guarantee you the reason why they did everything tonight and they escalated things to where they did and they got the ball rolling on Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch is because why would Sasha Banks, why would Sasha Banks at all give WWE the upper hand in planning something long term? The last time they planned something long term with Sasha Banks, she ended up being a four time women's champion with a total reign of 30 days. The long, the long time, the long term plan for Sasha Banks was to be women's cha- tag team champions with Bailey. What happened there? They took them off of Sasha and Bailey to give them to the Iconics. After telling them that they were going to give them the titles and plan and build around them, only to take the titles off of them. Sasha doesn't want anything long term with WWE. I can almost guarantee it because WWE doesn't speak the language of long term. I want what I want now. This is what needs to be done. He'll turn Becky Lynch title. That's it. Done. I'll take the women's division and the title and this feud where it needs to go. Put me there now. Instead of waiting three or four months or waiting till WrestleMania, who the fuck knows what they're going to do with her in all that time? They're doing it now. Because Sasha probably doesn't want to wait. That's why. But, how fucked up is that? That the storyline needs to be jeopardized in some way from being as great as it could be to rushed because of WWE's inconsistencies. That's what I'm upset about. This is a WrestleMania-worthy match that should be happening at WrestleMania, not at some fucking D-level pay-per-view like Clash of Champions. When has Clash of Champions ever meant anything to WWE? Never. 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 Now, on the flip side, Becky finally has legit competition. Sasha Banks arguably is one of the best female performers, if not the best female wrestler in all of WWE on the main roster, including Charlotte. Clowns. I enjoy Sasha's style a little bit more. She is more like what I love in the ring. She wrestles like a guy. That's what I enjoy. She don't give a fuck. She's going to go out there and put her fucking body on the line. All these women that you watch, they're they're afraid to break a fucking nail. They slap exactly like a girl is supposed to slap. There's no intensity. There's no fucking, you know, there's no intrigue. There's there's nothing that captivates you in that ring. It's all fluff. Nobody knows how to take a bump. Nobody knows how to fucking run a rope. Nobody takes any risk. Sasha wrestles like one of the guys uh, does. That's That's why I enjoy her so much. This... If it had the proper time to be built, could be great. But again, I understand why they're doing it. And with Sasha being back, like I said, Becky has a legit competitor finally coming out of WrestleMania, not named Ronda Rousey. I'm going to revert back to Sasha. I can understand people being upset with this too because they're rewarding Sasha for being out for six months and giving her a title shot against Becky Lynch. I understand that. I understand that, but... Who does WWE have right now? You got to look at the realistic option of it. You got to look at the realistic landscape of it. Who is there? What what do you want? Dana Brooke to be fighting for the fucking women's title? Come on. Seriously. WWE is not going to push anybody else. Asuka and Kairi Sane are an afterthought. Dana Brooke, Naomi, Carmella's dancing around with fucking R-Truth. Escaping VIP catering because they didn't have mashed fucking potatoes and catering that night. It's a circus. But with the women's division, with Sasha coming back, look at the women's division now. Becky has legit competition. After Sasha, Ronda's going to be back. Shayna is inevitably going to get called up. The women's division was looked at as a fucking eyesore on Monday Night Raw. Now with Sasha Banks, Becky, Ronda coming back, and the potential addition of Shayna Baszler. Man, you're looking at something that has got my attention and hasn't even happened yet. I'm going to enjoy this. Because this needed to happen. This needed to happen tonight. Sasha's a heel. Sasha might not have sounded like a heel in Toronto, but they'll be in Minneapolis next week. Becky Lynch is the most over female on the roster. They wanted to solidify, first and foremost, that heel turn tonight. Whether it made sense, whether you want to see it now this quickly or not, it's a moot point. The heel turn was the most important thing about this. Get Sasha heel. If she came back as a babyface, it would be like nothing changed and six months would have been zero. 
It wouldn't have been like she's been out for six months. Heel turn was the most important thing, and she pulled it off beautifully. Now we wait to hear from Sasha Banks, and she can add the sprinklers on top of the Sunday and solidify the heel turn against Becky Lynch. That's where the money is going to be. When Sasha opens her mouth and gives us the reason of why she did what she did, and she brings up the fact that she was out for six months, and she gives us the reason why she went out, that's when you're going to see Sasha Banks full-blown heel. This is awesome. I'm excited about women's wrestling just because this woman is back. She does look a little bit hypocritical, but that's not my judgment call to make. I just want them to be happy. I just want her to be happy. I know why for a fact. And I went over this time and time again. I know why that woman was unhappy. Anyone watching with two functioning eyeballs and a functioning brain knows why that woman was out for six months. You would be feeling the same way. That woman is back and in title contention where she belongs. She's a heel, like she should be. The boss is back, and she's going to make the overall women's division that much better on Monday Night Raw. I can't wait. We'll see what WWE does. They failed Sasha Banks on five different occasions. Four title reigns alone on Monday Night Raw, and one with Bayley as tag team champions. Can they go for a sixth? I don't know. I hope not. But I know for a fact... And I don't need a Brad Shepard or Dave Meltzer or I don't even need the, the word from her husband. I, I, I would bet a lot of money on the fact that the reason why this is happening is because Sasha wanted this to happen. And WWE's long-term planning, Sasha doesn't want to deal with that shit. There's no reason for her to deal with that shit because they have not given her any reason. Any reason at all to trust. So I'm loving this. We'll see what happens. Viking Raiders versus Carter Mason and Sebastian Suave. One minute. Typical War Raiders match. They won with Thor's Hammer here. So there you go. Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss versus the Kabuki Warriors. This match ended in eight minutes. Asuka and Kairi Sane are buried. I guarantee you when these two women's contracts are up, they're either asking Triple H to go back down to NXT. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. They, they ask Triple H to go back down to NXT or they go to AEW. And le, please, le, please, please elaborate. Tell me how uh, AEW is going to end up like TNA in 2006, 2008, like a WWE waste bin. Yeah, Asuka and, uh, and Kairi Sane are waste bin material, right? Give me a break. They should not be in this bit. Do you know how ridiculous it looks for Alexa Bliss to be pinning fucking Kairi Sane on Monday Night Raw? Now, who do they got? Who is next for Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross? You just beat the only legit non-team in WWE's women's division. Who's next? Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? Yeah. Try and generate interest for that one. Seth Rollins and AJ Styles with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. This one went eight minutes. Clickbait. Clickbait. They tried to get you all show with this marquee match, and it went eight minutes. Ricochet came out for the save because Anderson and Gallows attacked Seth. Ricochet ran out. He got beat up. And he got a boot of doom. And the OC threw Ricochet out of the ring. Braun Strowman made the save. He cleared the ring of Anderson and Gallows. And then fended off AJ Styles and gave him a running power slam. And Braun Strowman came out there and made a statement on Monday night. He was not at SummerSlam. Figured he would be... After SummerSlam, showing face, he gave Styles a running power slam. Braun picked up the Universal Championship and presented it to Seth Rollins, and they actually shook hands. I am not a betting man, but I know for a fact that we're probably going to get a six-man tag next week, and I don't like that at all because the OC is a legit stable, and I don't want to see Rollins and two fucking other guys battling the OC. Realistically, it should have been Rollins, Moxley, and Reigns versus the OC. WWE failed on that four years ago. Now we gotta see Rollins, Ricochet, and Strowman versus the OC. So what did this do, folks? What did this do? AJ Styles clearly 
is going to continue his feud with Ricochet. For whatever reason, I don't know. On what grounds does Ricochet deserve another United States Championship? He lost clean to AJ Styles at SummerSlam. This could only mean that Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins is going to be the next Universal Championship title feud. And if that excites you, man, your levels of mediocrity are nauseating. They are. You are one who lives a mediocre life. How could anyone be pleased with Seth Rollins, who legitimately is a top-tier elite wrestler in this industry, going up against Braun Strowman, who can't wrestle himself out of a fucking paper bag. He couldn't even bring a Victoria's Secret mannequin to a good match. You're going to put him in the ring with the Universal Champion, Seth Rollins? Maybe if it was Brock Lesnar, but Seth Rollins? The guy's been buried on Monday Night Raw, time and time and time again. The guy cannot wrestle without a gimmick. And you're going to give me Seth Rollins versus Braun Strowman. Clearly, that's the direction that they're setting up because you don't have Braun Strowman pick up the Universal title and hand it to Seth Rollins after looking at it and admiring it. Hmm, that could be mine without booking a match at Clash of Champions. And you know what? I don't even need that to be the selling point for me. I know Paul Heyman loves Braun Strowman. I know Paul Heyman loves Seth Rollins. These, everybody in this mix, everyone in this mix, the OC, Styles, Ricochet, Rollins, Strowman, these are all Paul Heyman guys. So no wonder they're all in the main event. This is your main event scene on Monday Night Raw, folks. But the fucked up thing is, Rollins doesn't have any heel challengers on Monday Night Raw to vie for that championship outside of Seth Rollins. You can't put AJ uh, out of uh, out of Seth Rollins and AJ Styles. You can't put AJ Styles against Seth Rollins because he has his own division. He's got his own title to worry about. Unless you want to make the United States Championship just a fucking prop. You don't want to do that. You got to put that title on the line at Clash of Champions. It's one of your major championships on this brand. So AJ, more than likely, is going up against Ricochet. We might get the ladder match at Clash of Champions. Rollins? He might be going up against Strowman. We got five weeks. I'm sure WWE is going to muster up something to get Braun Strowman into universal title contention. And folks, his title reign, if that's the case, is not starting off the way that it needs to start off. So we're going right back to the Baron Corbin Summer of Terror with Braun Strowman closing out the summer and Rollins' second universal title reign. Awful. Awful. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they give me a good match if that's the case. I don't fucking know. I doubt it. Braun Strowman has not had one memorable match at all in his entire career. You mean to tell me he's going to go into Clash of Champions against Seth Rollins and give me a classic? Please. This is not WWE 2K20, folks. This is real life. And Braun Strowman is nothing more than a novelty act pretending to be a wrestler. And Rollins is a pro wrestler pretending to be a fucking legit champion, but he's got the WWE backing him, and they failed him once. There's no doubt in my mind they're going to fail him again. I'm getting out of here because my allergies are killing me. Thank you guys so very much, man. If you enjoyed this video, let me know down below. And if you have any thoughts on Sasha Banks and Seth Rollins and the King of the Ring, it's been a big night, man. It's been a big night. It's been a long weekend. I'm wrestled out. We got SmackDown Live tomorrow. Let me know all your thoughts on all that stuff down below. And I will see you guys right back here on Tuesday for SmackDown Live. Buddy Murphy has a match. Holy shit. Too bad it's against Roman Reigns. And more than likely, we'll be seeing a fucking Superman punch and a spear and a one, two, three. Poor Buddy Murphy. We'll see you guys later.